Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 30 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to introduce something called a basis of a subspace. And the idea here is that any subspace of Rn, it can be written as a span of a set of vectors. But it can be written as a span of a set of vectors in a whole bunch of different ways. For example, if you have a two-dimensional plane in three-dimensional space, you could write that plane as a span of, say, 65 different vectors. Just pick any 65 vectors on that plane, and as long as they're not all collinear, then the span of those 65 vectors is going to be the entire plane. Okay, but that's kind of a silly thing to do, right? Like, why would you use 65 different vectors when you could get away with many fewer vectors, right? You could throw a lot of those away, and the span would still be the entire plane. In particular, you could truncate that all the way down to just a set of two vectors. Pick any two vectors that are not collinear, do not point on the same line, on that plane, and their span is going to be the whole plane, okay? Bases capture this idea. They captured this idea that, you know, you don't need a span of a whole bunch of vectors. There's sort of, you know, a smallest possible set of vectors that still spans that subspace. And that smallest set of vectors, that's a basis. Okay, so definition time. Okay, a basis of a subspace is it's any set of vectors that has these two properties. So the first one is it's got to span the entire subspace, okay? It's got to span all of S. In other words, you have to be able to write everything in S as a linear combination of the members of the basis, okay? And then property B, the other property that you need, is you need this set, this basis, it's got to be linearly independent, okay? And remember the idea there because that sort of means that there's no redundancies in this set. There's nothing that you can toss away from the set while retaining its span, okay? If you throw anything away, you're going to make its span strictly smaller. That's the idea behind linear independence. Okay, so you throw these two ideas together and you get exactly what we talked about. It spans the entire set S, it spans that entire subspace, but also there's no redundancies. It's sort of as small as possible, okay? If you throw anything away, you're changing its span. So you're changing the subspace that spans. Okay, so one way to think about this is sort of in terms of like, you know, this Goldilocks and the Three Bears story, you know, it's the, the bases, the thing, the thing that makes them perfect is they're not too big and they're not too small. They're just right. Like they're sort of the perfect size to describe the subspace that you're talking about. Okay, the fact that they span the entire subspace, that tells you sort of they're big enough to describe everything in S. Whereas then the fact that they're linearly independent, that tells you they're small enough that, you know, there's sort of no redundancies in that set, okay? And it's sort of this pull and push between these two properties here that actually makes them useful, okay? It's, they sort of match out at this one particular size in the middle, the size of a possible basis. All right, so let's go through a couple quick examples, and we're going to start off with examples of bases of all of Rn, okay? So not of proper subspaces of Rn, but just Rn itself. And we're going to start off with something called the standard basis of Rn, okay? And what this is, is this is the set consisting of the n standard basis vectors, okay? So we're finally seeing where this terminology standard basis vector actually came from in the first place. The reason that we called these vectors e1, e2, up to en, the reason we called those standard basis vectors is because they come from something called the standard basis, Okay, so remember, like what these vectors are is e1, it just has a 1 in the first entry, e2 has a 1 in the second entry, and so on. And so to show that this actually is a basis, we've got to show two things, right? We go back up to this definition, and oh, we've got to show that property A holds. We've got to show that it spans all of our N. And property B holds. We've got to show that it's linearly independent. Fortunately, for the standard basis, both of these properties are fairly straightforward to show. So property A, to show that it spans all of our N, we've just got to show that everything in our N can be written as a linear combination of these standard basis vectors. And this is something that we learned how to do way back in week one, right? This is one of the first things that we said in this course. We said that, hey, any vector, it can be written as its first entry times E1 plus its second entry times E2 and so on down the line. So boom, that's all there is to it, okay? We've, we've shown that the standard basis spans all of our N. Okay, property B, we've got to show that it's linearly independent as well, okay? And remember from last week, the way that we show that is we have to show that, hey, if we have a linear combination of these standard basis vectors and we set it equal to zero, the only way to make that happen is if each coefficient equals zero. That's our goal here. We want to show that the only linear combination of these guys that gives us zero is the zero linear combination, okay? So in other words, we want to show that this implies each C has to be zero, Okay, but if you just write out what this vector on the left here is, its first entry is C1, 
its second entry is C2, and so on down the line, its last entry is Cn. And those are all equal to zero. So yeah, each of the coefficients are zero. Okay, so yes, this really is a basis because it satisfies both of those properties there. Okay, but maybe, I mean, sort of these really trivial examples, they're, they're in a sense, they're harder to figure out what's going on because it's harder to figure out, oh, is this a definition or is this something that I've shown? So let's do sort of a, a, a bit of an uglier example just to get a, maybe a better feel for how to show these two properties and show that something's a basis. Let's show now that this set, that's a basis of R2, of two-dimensional space. All right. So let's go through this. Setup's the same though, okay? We've got to show two things. We've got to show that it spans all of R2, and we've got to show that it's linearly independent. So let's start off with the fact that it spans all of R2. Okay, so the way you do that, we did something like this last week. The way you do this is you pick an arbitrary vector in R2, okay? So I'm just gonna call it x, y. And my goal is to show that I can write that as a linear combination of these two vectors, of two, one, and one, three, okay? So my goal is to show that for any x, y, I can find C1 and C2 that make this happen. Okay, this is a linear system. I'm just trying to determine when a certain linear system has a solution. So let's write it as a linear system. And here I've jumped all the way to writing it as a linear system in augmented matrix form, right? What's gonna happen here is I get X equals C1 times two plus C2. Oh, that's this first equation here. Like these columns are corresponding to C1 and C2. Okay, and then the second coordinate of these vectors are telling me that y equals c1 plus 3c2. Okay, and that's exactly what the second equation is. y equals c1 plus 3c2. Okay, and now to determine when that linear system has a solution, well, let's just get into row echelon form. In particular, I want to get a zero down here, so I'm just going to do row 2 minus 1 half of row 1 to get the linear system in this form here. Okay, now it's in row echelon form. I've got my leading entries here. I've got, you know, zeros in the bottom left, all zero rows. There are no zero rows, but all the zero rows are tucked away at the bottom. It's in row echelon form. Okay, so now I try to determine when this has a solution for what, which values of X and Y make this have a solution. And well, I mean, it has a solution for every single value of X and Y, right? I mean, I've got a leading entry here and a leading entry here. I can always solve this linear system. Okay, if I wanted to, I could do a scaling operation to get a one in this entry here, and I could get a zero up there, and then I could rescale to get a one here. Okay, I'm always going to be able to explicitly solve this linear system because I don't have a zero row with a non-zero thing on the right-hand side. That never happens, no matter what x and y are. Okay, so my conclusion from here is, hey, I've always got a linear system, okay, for all x and y. So yeah, this set here that I started with, it really does span all of R2. All right, great. So it spans. Next up, let's check linear independence. Okay, unfortunately, we've got a little bit of an out here because this set only contains two vectors. And remember, we learned last week that a set, set con consisting of just two vectors, it's linearly independent if and only if those vectors are not scalar multiples of each other. And well, that's something you can just eyeball. 2, 1, and 1, 3, no, nah, those don't point in the same direction. They're not scalar multiples of each other. So that set is linearly independent. So I'm done. Okay, that's all there is to it. It's got those two properties, so great. I know it's a basis. Okay, and the important takeaway from these two examples is that if you have a subspace, it can and will actually have more than one basis. Okay, so for example, we just showed that R2, it has two different bases. It has, well, this set 2, 1, 1, 3 that we just talked about, but it also has the standard basis, E1, E2. Okay, those are both bases of R2, okay? And there are actually infinitely many different other bases of R2 as well. And for all subspaces, except for the zero subspace, okay? All other subspaces have infinitely many different bases. Okay, so keep that in mind, okay? Bases can look wildly different from each other, but that's okay, okay? That's sort of intended. All right, so next class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start looking at properties of bases and start seeing what we can do with them. And in particular, we're gonna see that even though, yeah, subspaces can have lots of different bases, they're all gonna have the same size, okay? So this sort of pull and push between, you know, spanning and linear independence, they always sort of meet in the middle at the exact same size, okay? You're never gonna have a basis of two vectors and a basis of three vectors of the same subspace. It just can't happen. So for example, I mean, like, the, the fact that both of these bases here have two vectors, that's not a coincidence, okay? If one basis has two vectors, then every basis of that subspace has to have two vectors. Okay, so we'll start talking about that next class and, you know, consequences of that fact next class. So I'll see you then.